Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for all the things you teach us. And we're thankful for the Sabbath, for each person, for the way that you work upon our hearts. Help us to have open hearts to truth. Help us to discern the precious and the vile, that your spirit can enlighten our minds and that we cannot be actuated by, by feeling and emotion, but by the understanding of your word. We pray, Lord, that you can be with us through thy spirit in teaching and guiding us. Help me in this presentation and help us to receive the message you have for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Now, I was looking over my presentations on the book of Hebrews. Now, I was doing a presentation every second week with, uh, um, with the American group for a bit, and then it got switched that uh, I had to do it on the Canadian Sabbath afternoon. And I was, I was looking back and looking at my count, and, and it appears, and I'm not certain, I have to go through some of the videos, but it looks like I missed chapter five. Um, but maybe I did it as part as chapter four. I'm going to have, I don't, I think I did chapter five, but I, I can't find it. So, because I remember looking at this, studying it, um, but I may have done it in part uh, when I was doing chapter four and then never came back and finished it. But um, if that's the case, if I don't have a study on chapter five, I may have to go back and look at that again um, and do a presentation on it. But this is the last chapter. And, and to me, the way that it starts is extremely appropriate for where we are today. Let brotherly love continue. And what does that mean? Why is Paul bring this up at this point? Maybe he's dealt with uh, issues in the church, with people bickering and well, but in, in the book of Hebrews, he's not addressing that so much as he does in some of the other letters, because he's writing to the to the Christian Jews in Jerusalem and, and to some who maybe aren't Christians, and he's appealing to them. And remember the chapters that we've gone through, uh, the faith chapter and chapter 12, which was the one that really was to encourage us that the work that God is has begun in us. Um, that he's begun with his people, that he's going to accomplish that. And he compares the covenants, right? So he compares the old covenant with the everlasting covenant, with the law being given on Mount Sinai. And then he says that we have to go to the heavenly Jerusalem, right? To the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. And, and, and so he's bringing us from, from the literal and, and earthly to the heavenly and spiritual. So right after he says, for our God is a consuming fire, he says, let brotherly love continue. So why does he say that? Because Paul has presented this long treatise to the Jews in Jerusalem, to the, to the Hebrews. And he's made a case for Christ that he is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary and that the new covenant is greater than the old covenant and that it's a heavenly promises, right? Because Abraham, he was looking for a, a heavenly country, not an earthly. So why does he here say, let brotherly love continue? What's his train of thought, if we can go into his mind? And could it relate to the Church of Philadelphia? Okay, right? Um, because he's talking about the Church of Brotherly Love. Let, let's, let's look at it that way. That this is not about fighting over territory. He's not, he's not engaged in a debate. He recognized that all of this is going to transform our characters. 
in the study last night uh, with the Vietnamese, they had asked a question about, you know, Christian character, um, what kind of lifestyle do we live? And, and I tried to emphasize that, you know, clothes, eating and drinking, they have their place. They have an importance. We need to be modest. We need to take care of our health. But we also need to reflect Christ's character. And Paul is not a debater, even though he did get in a fight with, uh, um, what's his name? Peter? No, not Peter. He got in a fight. Well, I guess he did get in a fight with Peter too. Uh, but with um, um, the guy he traveled with, uh, um, Barnabas. Uh, was it Barnabas? Barnabas? Barnabas, is that the one that he got in a fight with? Yes, yeah, so over John Mark. Yes, okay. Yeah, that's who he got in a fight with. Okay. Paul and Barnabas, right? So it was Barnabas. He got in a fight with him. They had to separate. Yeah, yeah for a little while. Because <laughs> <laughs> they had this issue. I mean, so it does happen, but that's not really Paul's character. You know, Paul is, he is a shepherd. He's leading and guiding the flock. He is one that cares for the churches, his messages to the churches, even though he can give a stiff rebuke, he's, he's just as ready to encourage. So he lays down some principles about the sacrifices that are pleasing to God. Remember, uh, David, when he committed murder and adultery, he says, you know, burnt offering and sacrifices for sins thou dost not desire, but a broken and a contrite spirit thou wilt not despise. The sacrifices of God are this character that we are to have. So then he says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Now, now this is kind of a, um, can we look at this a bit more spiritually rather than just literally? Can we do that? I don't see why not. Okay. So a stranger, what is a stranger? Someone you don't know. Okay, well, generally we think of it as somebody we don't know. But in a biblical sense, what is a stranger? Maybe somebody doesn't, outside of the the truth, you know, or Gentile or something. Yeah. Yeah, so it could be almost anyone. Yeah. And is it true that we need to entertain anyone? But this is not, of course, about, this is about hospitality, Right. Do we minister to everyone that God brings our way? Or do we just enter, uh, are we just hospitable to those that we care about? He says, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Can we think of an example of that? Well, this really is to Abraham. Yeah, Abraham. Yeah, he entertained. Yeah, on, on, under the oaks of Mamre, he was uh, mm -hmm. approached by three strangers, which turned out to be Christ and two angels. Yeah. And Lot, was it, uh, so those are the same angels with Lot? Yeah. Lot that one, okay. So obviously, um, you know, this literally can be true. But also, what are angels representative of in Scripture? Messages. Yeah, messages. Because they're messengers, messengers of God. And, and we need to be aware that God can give us a message uh, in ways that we don't expect. That we shouldn't be closed off. We should be open to what God wants to teach us. But of course, you know, he is talking practically about the fact that we need to be hospitable. We need to, we need to care for others. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. And of course, this is literally true. Those Christians that are in prison, they need to be visited and encouraged. 
people that suffer adversity. But this is also people who are bound in sin. People who are struggling. You know, our nature is to kick people when they're down, especially if we don't like them. But God is not telling us to do that. We need to love our enemies, do good to those that hate us and despitefully use us. Now, it says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Can we take this spiritually? If we consider ourselves in a marriage to God, then yes, if we're going outside of him. Yeah. And spiritual adultery is what? Going after strange women. Right. So after other churches of false doctrines. Doctrine, you say doctrine too, and mm-hmm. strange doctrines. You know, and um, in Colin's study today, he he went over Miller's rules. He he directed us to Miller's rules, and and he established the things that we already know to be true, and worked from that. And he came back to Miller's rules, and we've been talking about Miller's rules, but there's many that aren't following Miller's rules now. We are to encourage them and try to help them. Right? They're not our enemies. We have, to, we have to recognize that many of those are suffering in adversity. But some of them will become whoremongers and adulterers. Some will be pushing false doctrine. And, and so we, we've seen this in this movement. We saw, saw it in the Millerite history. Many times in this movement. Yeah. So Hebrews 13, verse 5, so let your conversation be without covetousness. Now, conversation is not really about talking. It has to do with your whole manner of life. That is everything that you do. That is your, your business transactions, your, your interactions with um, your friends, with people in church, people that you're fellowshipping with. And it's to be without covetousness. It is we need to be satisfied with what God has given us to do. And we can't be jealous of somebody who has, in our minds, a position that we think we should have. And so we've seen a lot in that, in our movement in that, a lot of self-seeking, jealousy. But we need to be content with whatever lot we have. Um, you know, one of the things I've learned, and, and I, I don't know if I want to share a lot of my personal experiences here, but other people can maybe relate to situations where you think you desire something and, and you think it's a good thing. But God withholds that thing from you. And the best thing that you can do is accept what God has given you. And then when you do that, every single time, God has given me something better. Amen. I have experienced that lots. Yes. And one example I could use is in my early 20s, in our upper room Bible studies, um, you know, I had been playing guitar since I was uh, 15. And so I would have been about 20, 20 three, maybe 23 years old, 22 years old. And we had this Bible study group and there was a a guy there who could write songs and and scripture songs. And I was really jealous of him. I wanted to be able to do this. And I tried writing some and I couldn't, I mean, I mean, I wrote them, but they were terrible. And, um, but I recognized that there, what was in my heart and I asked God, I said, God, if, if music is such a stumbling block for me, I'm just going to get rid of my guitar and I will never play guitar again. And what ended up happening, my, my wife at the time, she said, well, can't you just keep the guitar for the children? And 
you know, she says, you know, she, they like to listen to you sing songs. They were very little then. Uh, I don't know if they like to hear me sing songs now, but, but back then they liked it. And, and the thing is I was willing to give it up, but God gave it back to me. And I, from then on, I could write scripture songs, but I never had those feelings anymore. I never had any of that pride about being a musician all those years. And, and that's what needs to happen in our hearts. We may think that we're justified in, in what we want and what we see happening with others. And we may think that we have a true criticism of their character, but actually what we're seeing is something in ourselves. For God says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we need to be content with whatever our lot is in life and always make the best of it. And, and this is so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And you can see why that follows. When we put our trust in God and we're not fighting that battle anymore, we now have somebody who is our helper who will fight for us and he will lift us and put us, give us responsibility that we never would have imagined and that we don't feel that we're capable of, of carrying out. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation or manner of life. So when we look at others, we need to, what does it mean to remember them that have rule over you? I think uh, probably respect, respect them. Okay. So it, it's kind of respect. Um, the idea here is recollect, rehearse, make mention, be mindful. And so it does come down to respect. Oh, sorry about that. You don't want to look at Greek. So, um, are we submissive to, to proper authority? Well, you have, you have, uh, in heaven, you have different positions in heaven. Yeah. So be the same thing in the church or a movement or whatever. Yeah. You know, we, it says in the Bible, we shouldn't be unruly. What does unruly mean? I mean, maybe they're trying to serve authority or... Uh... Yeah, it, it's like we don't want to be controlled by others. That we, you know, you, for lack of a better word, you know, that, that colloquialism, you're not the boss of me kind of a thing. And often we get that attitude. People are like, well, who are you to speak to me? And if we have respect for one another, especially those that that God has placed over us, we can, we can actually use them as an example. That is, we can follow their faith. They can actually be a benefit to us. But often we fight. We fight, we want to be heard. Our, our views and opinions have to be heard. It uh, depends how we value people too. You know, right. If we, if we don't value people <laughs> like we do ourselves. And uh... yeah, you know, sometimes I've had situations, and I'm sure all of you have had this, where um, you need to be encouraged. That is, you're uncertain about your value. You know, are you are you really accomplishing what you should? And and. And I'm focusing and going to focus on both. We sometimes have in that situation, somebody comes and encourages us. But I've often had where I'm in that state and somebody comes along and kicks me when I'm down. Sort of like the comforters of Job. Um, and, and you wonder sometimes what it is they're thinking. 
I mean, I've had pastors do this to me. I mean, I had a pastor who twice threatened me, said he was going to make my life miserable. And it was only because I hurt his feelings. And I, and I was like, you know, it, you're not a pastor. Because, and I told him he was lucky that he was dealing with someone like me who could take it. But if he treated other people that way, he could actually destroy them, destroy their faith. So it, it's important that we recognize that we show each other respect especially those that are teaching the word of God. You know, Ellen White talks about, you know, after, after church, you shouldn't go and have uh, the pastor for dinner. I mean, that is cannibalistically speaking, by going over his sermon and, and pointing out all of his flaws. Because you can miss out on the message that he may have given. And we need to do that with others. Uh, an example of this was uh, back in 2016 uh, when we were at the School of the Prophets. Um, there was a lady there who rubbed me the wrong way. Um, but she was doing a presentation, which, which I will never forget. It was a presentation on the three different interpretations Ellen White has of the parable of the ten virgins. And my nature was such that I didn't really want to listen to what she had to say. I wanted to look at it with a critical eye. But I recognized that what she was saying was true. And I listened with an open heart instead. And that's an important thing to be able to do. When there's somebody whose voice grates on you, whose mannerisms you can't stand, um, who just rubs you the wrong way, it doesn't mean that person doesn't have words of truth that you need to hear. Now, the next thing Paul says is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, if you look at that sentence there, what, what is he saying? Why is he putting this sentence? I mean, you could just take that sentence out. You know, you could go to verse 9, be not carried about by diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have occupied therein. So, so I mean, he, he's just saying all these things that we should do. But right there on verse 8, he says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. So what is Paul thinking when he puts that verse there? Now, I find it funny when you look at commentaries, they'll say, well, it doesn't, it, I, we don't think it's actually part of the original letter. <laughs> Is he not given encouragement? You know, so that if you're in a position where you're being told something uh, and you feel oppressed by it, that you say, no, Jesus doesn't change. You know, this is for your benefit. Yeah, and and, he, and so, but why does he, why does he, because there's a reason why, I think. Because God set up this. the system? Because God set up the system of rule? Yes, and who, who is over who in hierarchy? But he set up a good system. And Christ is the one who is submitted. Oops. Um, the screen is frozen for me. The whole thing is frozen. Yeah, I think uh, Theodore's dropped out. Yes, He'll be back in a second, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I thought it was just me. I've been having a lot of problems with my Wi-Fi today. It's not you. Mm, there's, okay. There's quite an issue that's been going on. Okay. 
Yeah, well, I think probably lots of people around the world are on Zoom today. That's true. Yeah. Okay. So, so, and, and it's not my internet connection because the one computer did not connect, disconnect, and the other one did. So, so it must be Zoom itself that's having problems. Okay. So, um, I just got to share my screen again, though. So when we look at, um, at this, at Galatians chapter four, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, right? Christ made himself as a servant, We also have this in um, Philippians, I think it's chapter two. Um, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. And we also were directed to um, Ephesians 4, verse 4. That's 14. Did it come out as 4? 4, verse 14. Yeah, 4, verse 14. Um, Now, this is addressing... um, Hebrews chapter 13, verse nine, the part where it's talking about the false doctrine. Um, But if we look before, we can see that there's a continuity of thought that Paul has here in Ephesians four, that he also has in uh, Hebrews chapter 13. So he says, and he gave some apostles No, that's not what I meant. I'm sorry. It's about not um, not being cared about with winds of doctrine, basically. I thought it was in the fourth chapter. Maybe it's the second. <laughs> is it um, Ephesians four fourteen is talking about tossed to and fro and carried about yeah, with winds of doctrine one. that we have yeah, to be that's no more children. Yeah tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Recording stopped. Here it goes again. Okay. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. <laughs> so we're going to go back here. So so the, the verse that was shared with us is Ephesians 4.14. So I'm going to go back to Hebrews. And we'll see what we're talking about here. Uh, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart is be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Now, why, why does he talk about meats when he's talking about doctrines? We talk about the meat of the word. Yeah, so he's comparing strange doctrines with food that's been offered to idols in some way. But he says, we have an altar whereof they may, they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. So, so let's go, let's go uh, to Ephesians again. So Ephesians chapter four. And so he talks about the church and, and, and about the the ministry of that that are the gift different gifts that are given to others apostles prophets evangelists pastors teachers and these are given for the perfect perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and we henceforth, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro 
and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speak the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So what is Paul talking about here? What is he talking about? Is he talking about the same thing here? Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Is Jesus Christ the end of our conversation, of our manner of life? As in the sense of a goal, the goal for our life, yes. Yes, and, and, and we can see that um, when we look at the Greek, this word end. Um, uh, well, it uses the word as, as going out and exit. So it's, it's like the end of a tunnel or a way of escape is another thing that it's used for figuratively. But it means an exit. And, and when we come to the end of our journey, is it not Christ that we are following? Is it not his character that we're going to have? Yes. So we have this, we have this path to go to. We have this exit. And it's leading us to Christ. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His promises of the past or can be fulfilled today, and they will continue to be fulfilled. We are part of the body of Christ, he's, which is the other illustration he uses in Ephesians, a building fitly framed together. We're fashioned after the similitude of Christ. We have his character. Now remember, this is Hebrews chapter 13. And at the beginning... Paul clearly shows us that Jesus is God in chapter one. And then in chapter two, he shows us that he clearly is man. He was made a little lower than the angels. We need to follow his pattern. And that's why we remember them that have the rule over us who have spoken unto us the word of God. And we need to follow their example because their example is leading us by us doing this by manifesting a character of Christ we will be on the right side of the issue and we've we've seen this happen in, in the negative side of this we've seen people who've understood the truth and would they allow other people to who ruled over them, would they give them the proper respect? I mean, I can think of examples of people, but I don't want to name anybody. But I've seen people who, it's clear that God was teaching them some things, but they believe that other people had to listen to them. And especially the leadership had to listen to them. And when their views or ideas were rejected, they just went off into darkness. Because it's God's truth, it's not ours. And we have to believe that God is going to take care of his truth. One thing we can't forget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is the thing that's going to save us, having a character of Christ. Now, when it says we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which served the tabernacle, he's talking about this altar, which is what altar? Yeah. 
because there's those that serve the tabernacle. He's talking about the actual temple. Do those people have a right to eat of the altar that we, that we, that we have? No. Yeah. So when he says not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein, is he not talking about the earthly sacrifices? The blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. If we're comparing scripture with scripture, I would say that's correct. Yeah. And so our altar is the altar on which Christ was sacrificed on. And they have no right to eat because they're, they're priests after the Levitical priesthood. But we have a high priest who's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, he's going to give quite a, I mean, maybe a graphic sort of illustration. But he says, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. So what is this talking about here? Verse 11, the body of those beasts. So it's just animals are brought in for sacrifice. Their blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin. They're burned without the camp. So why does he use this illustration from the sanctuary? The literal is that they're referring to the, the, the bulls that are slaughtered, right? Yeah, so there's certain offerings that are slaughtered. The blood is brought in, but they're going to be burned. Um, and this is Leviticus chapter 4, uh, talking about the bullock. The whole bullock shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn him on the wood with fire where the ashes are poured out, shall he be burnt. And we also see that in Leviticus 16, the bullock for a sin offering, the goat for a sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make an atonement in the holy place. shall one carry forth without the camp and they shall burn in the fire, their skins and their flesh and their dung. So there's certain sin offerings that the blood goes in and makes atonement but they're going to be burned without the camp, outside of the camp. Then he says, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. So he's making an argument again. He's going back to some of his earlier ideas about Christ. But here he's talking about him as the sacrifice. But if, if we're looking yeah. not just at Leviticus, for the priests, but if we're looking at Exodus for the for the whole people, okay, then that verse would also give reference to Exodus twenty nine fourteen, right? Okay, so Exodus twenty nine fourteen. But the flesh of the bullock and his skin with his dung shall thou burn with fire without the camp. It is a sin offering. Now, this is um, you know, this and now this offering is for just reading about this the priest, thing. isn't it? Yes, the consecration of the priests. So, okay. in other words, it ties it directly into Leviticus, but it's also giving reference back to the sin offering. Yeah. Okay. So we know Jesus, he is, he's our high priest, and he's also the offering. But he suffered without the gate, outside of the city. Let us go there forth, therefore, unto him, without the camp, bearing his reproach. So, I mean, obviously, as Christians, they're going to be cut off from the sacrifices. They're not going to be doing the earthly sacrifices anymore. Correct? Correct. But I mean, as we're looking at this and as, as we are comparing line upon line, yeah. we also in Leviticus 6 
have a very specific um, admonition and comment. Okay, which verse? verse? Uh, Leviticus 6, verse 30. Okay. Okay, and it says, No sin offering whereof any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of the congregation to reconcile with all in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burnt in the fire. So that means any of the blood which is brought into the tabernacle of the congregation to reconcile the holy place is not eaten. So we'll see that offerings are eaten. Where is the blood? What's done with the blood with the offerings that are eaten? Sprinkled? No. Poured out at the altar? It's poured out at the base of the altar. Right? So, so um, I, mean, I mean, we didn't go into, in our study on the sanctuary on uh, Friday evenings, we didn't go into detail. Um, about all the sacrifices, and it is a hard thing to keep track of. Okay, but yeah. Okay, yeah. but take a look at Leviticus sixteen, verses fourteen to nineteen. Okay. So Leviticus sixteen, verse fourteen to nineteen, and he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Now, of course, this is the Day of Atonement. This isn't the daily ministry, right? Okay. And then they shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself as for his household um, and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. And he shall take the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness, uncleanness of the children of Israel. Um, and so what particularly did you want us to see here? Well, the point, the point is that there is times where the blood is poured out yeah. at the bottom of the altar. And there are times where this blood is also sprinkled. But the, the situation with this same bullock that they're talking about here remains the same. That the skin and the carcass is basically burned outside the camp. It's right. not eaten. Yeah. yeah, so there is blood brought in, but when that happens, it's not eaten by the priests. So all I'm trying to get at is that yeah, both okay. answers were correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is blood sprinkled. I wasn't saying that there isn't. But the blood that's sprinkled is not eaten. That animal's not eaten. But when the animals are eaten, the blood's poured out at the base of the altar. It doesn't go into uh, the tabernacle. It's not sprinkled there. It's put on the horns of the altar, but not into the tabernacle itself. Now, why would that be? I mean, you know, we never dealt a lot with all these different um, symbolisms of the sacrifices. We didn't go through the red heifer offering and, and things like that. offering is not sprinkled and so some people say see Ella White made a mistake um, but but if you read it carefully she's she's just not being as specific but she does have some qualifying words that some people just skip over but anyway uh, the point is that our sins get transferred to the sanctuary not by the individual sin offering directly that is 
the blood of when an individual brings his sin offering and he cuts the throat of, of the goat or the lamb, um, then it's caught by the high priest. The yeah. And it's going to be sprinkled out at the base of the altar. It, and the, and the, and the offering is going to be eaten by the priest. So, but the priest still bears their sins, but I think it's for the, the king and the whole congregation. I can't remember. There's four different offerings, the individual, the whole congregation, uh, the priest, and um, what's the other one? That's, do you know which chapter that's in? Sin offering. The king. Okay, the king. So you have the king, the whole congregation, uh, the priest, and the individual. And two of them, blood goes into the sanctuary and the offerings burnt. And two of them, the offerings eaten and the blood's poured out at the base of the altar. I can't remember which ones are which. I just know for the individual, the blood's not carried into the sanctuary to... Uh, it, it's eaten by the priest. So, so going back to Hebrews chapter 13 here, why does he talk about the fact, and, and I think you alluded it to it, Dwight, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. How does the offering being burnt without the camp, um, what does that have to do with sanctifying the people? Would that be removing the sin from the camp as symbol of saying that this is now complete and done? Yeah. So Christ, in a sense, is bearing our sin without the camp. He's removing it away, right? And it says, let us therefore, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his approach, reproach. So here he's using this illustration because going outside of the camp means, in a sense, we're banished from Israel and we're going to bear the reproach that he bore. So this is a reproach by having the offering burnt outside of the camp. And it, it represents Christ's reproach. That he's rejected, despised and rejected of men. Does that make sense? It's making a good point. Yeah. And then he says, for we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Now, this is before the destruction of Jerusalem that Paul writes the book of Hebrews. And we know that because he always speaks as if the temple is still in operation. So it's before 70 AD. So he knows that we don't have a, a continuing city. That is, Jerusalem is not going to always exist but we seek the one to come and that's the heavenly Jerusalem. Now to put this into practical terms, um, when it comes to the message that God has given this movement, are we willing to bear the reproach of Christ? That's a question we're going to have to ask ourselves daily. Because we do, we will have to bear the reproach of Christ. Exactly. If we accept this message. And, and it's unfortunate because it's not just about the people that we don't like that we have to bear the reproach of Christ. Many people who are our friends will also reject us. And, the, and we have to be willing to bear that reproach because we have we have a city that we're looking for in the future. We're not looking for our place here and now. I mean, to me, that was the big mistake of many of the people in the movement who were looking for position. Because when you're looking for position, you're acting as if this is what God has promised us. People want to have a place in the church. They want to have a place in the movement. They want to have status among their friends. They want to be looked up to. You. The kingdom that Christ has for us 
is the kingdom. The only way to that kingdom is the way that Christ showed us. And what's the way to Christ's kingdom? Through him. Yeah. And that's the end of the conversation, right? That's the, that, that's where we have to follow. We have to take up our cross daily and follow him. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So the sacrifice, this daily or continual sacrifice here that we're offering is an offering of praise. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifice, God is well pleased. Now, uh, to do good, we can understand to do good. But what is communicate? What does he mean by communicate? This, this word has changed meaning over the years. Okay, what's the word? Okay, what's the word? What's the root of the word communicate? Or converse, maybe converse to commune, to commune, or and and community. It it means to to do good to others. So communicate is distributing your wealth to those in need. That's communication, right? So uh, I mean, I like looking at these old English words and, and how they've changed over the years. Now we usually just mean communicate means to share your ideas, but it used to mean to share your things, to impart to others. Now it does also relate to imparting truth to others. Right. So communication is not just about um, giving goods. It is about um, spreading the good news. But if, again, we were doing line upon line, if we were looking at Galatians 6.6, 6, yeah. it would give us a, uh, another way of supporting exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So Galatians 6.6, 6, that him that is taught in the word to communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. So if we're taught in the word, we have to communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. So can you explain this verse, what you understand by it? Okay. In other words, are we not going to share this mm -hmm. with others that, we are <clears throat> attempting to explain our faith with. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and when you look at Galatians 6, 6, I mean, you have to think about the context here too, which this is one of my, my favorite passages, uh, but Galatians has lots of them. Uh, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual... Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So this is, of course, telling us that when we see somebody who's struggling with sin, we're not going to kick them while they're down. We're going to try to restore them. And we do so in a spirit of meekness, not a, a, of standing over that other and, and trying to say how much better we are than them, which often is what I see happening because we have to recognize that there is a danger that we also have. And then he says, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. But then he says something quite interesting as he goes through this. So when he talks about bearing one another's burdens, he then says, for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for every man shall bear his own burden. So what is Paul trying to tell us about burden bearing? It, it's, it just relates to verse one. 
Can I bear someone else's burdens if I haven't first learned how to bear my own burdens? No, and can you bear someone else? Can you help bear someone else's burdens if you don't understand what their burden is? Right. Yeah. And so when he says, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. But he's show, showing that in order to get to that point, we, we do need to bear one another's burdens, but we can't do this in a spirit of pride. Because we have to bear our own burden first. And only then can we lift up others' burdens. So that's why he says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. So lots of very good counsel that Paul gives in his word that we often just, you know, sort of skirt by. We take a glancing look. But uh, in verse 17 of Hebrews, he says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do with it, do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Now, of course, when we talk about somebody who has a rule over us and we need to submit ourselves, it needs to be somebody who actually cares. But we also need to make it easy for them that they may do it with joy, not with grief. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all, th all things willing to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now, Paul is, of, now he's, He's starting to go into this personal um, appeal. At, at the beginning of the book of Hebrews, Paul doesn't have an introduction, but he is going to have this benediction, and, he, and he's moving into it here uh, um, to, to the end of this, this letter. So what does he mean? Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly, but I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to the, to the sooner. What is he asking them to pray for? It's kind of an awkward uh, couple of verses. That, he's, that he is uh, requesting prayer mm -hmm. in this situation. Mm -hmm. and he wants to, yeah and he wants to return to jerusalem okay and and so people say the language here is such as paul would use on the supposition that he was then a prisoner at rome i don't think so yeah I, yeah so people um, are making these different guesses we don't know but definitely wherever he is he wants to be restored to them he's he wants to be in their company again so that means he has been in their company and he wants to be there again. And when he says, pray for us that we trust we have a good conscience, that, that he believes that what he's doing is correct. And that could imply that he's being restrained somewhere. So we don't know the circumstances of the writing of the book of Hebrews. Just not known. We don't know when it was written. Now, there is this benediction. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So remember, remember what the book of Hebrews is about. It's about Christ being our high priest. But it's also about this covenant. So what is the blood of the everlasting covenant? 
What does it do? It is the promise for the remission of our sins. It cleanses us from what we should have expected. Yeah, it will make us, yeah, it'll make us perfect in every good work to do his will. The blood of bulls and goats could not make the comer thereunto perfect, right? The offerings of sin, of blood of bulls and goats. It could not make him perfect as pertaining to the conscience. And, And here he's talking about the conscience a bit earlier. But really what he's talking about is the perfection of character. And it's, it's him working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. And the glory goes to Christ, not to man. And this, and this summation here of the gospel in Hebrews 13, 20 and 21 um, is a very, uh, a very good summation. It's very succinct, but it has a lot of threads in it. It ties us to Christ being a shepherd. It talks about his resurrection from the dead. It talks about the blood of the everlasting covenant. And it talks about the work that he wants to accomplish in us. And these are the threads that we've been studying in our sanctuary study. And this is the work that God wants to do in this movement, in each of us individually. And then he has his greetings. I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation. uh, For I've written a letter unto you in a few words. In few words, know that our brother Timothy is set at liberty with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. Salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Grace be unto you all. Amen. And so it's written to the Hebrews from Italy by Timothy. So this is why they say it may have been when he was in prison in Rome, but we don't know specifically the circumstances. So any final thoughts about what we have studied in the book of Hebrews? What is this telling us to do at this time, December 25th, 2021? This is presenting before us the work that we're soon to have to undertake in earnest. Okay, so we have a work before us. Are we, are we fit for the work? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's overwhelming. But God has given us a witness. And what has he given us as a witness, as an earnest so that we can trust that he's going to continue to be with us. It's kind of a trick question. He's given us the prophetic lines. He's given us the lines. Now, those lines are just not lines on a whiteboard, are they? No, they're not. They're actually our experience. Correct? If we have participated in this movement and we have accepted the light God has given us, we will have experienced these lines. It's a repeat of Millerite history. It's a repeat of the first and second angel's message. And unless you have experienced the first and second angel's message and accepted them, you can't benefit from the third and adventism because they had rejected the first and second angels messages they need to hear those messages again but it's it's not just millerite history it's our history we've experienced millerite history and we now have an appreciation at least we should of what they experienced. 
and we've been experiencing all the things they experienced after October 22nd, 1844. Now, um, and the, the study in uh, Colin's study that he was doing, I, I, I missed a lot of it because I had to have a nap and uh, I watched some of it without actually listening to what he was saying, just reading the, the verses. And they had a discussion afterwards. And, um, you know, I, I brought up Stephen's chart, the 777 years from 457. And I want to look at this here and um, try to understand what this means. So I'll share this. So what is this we're looking at? Can somebody Be, tell us? Beside it being Stephen's chart? Yes. <laughs> What does it mean? What is it we're looking at? We're given kind of an outline of the movement because either we are coming to a point where we accept Christ and everything that he is able to do on our behalf, or we're going to come to this at the Sunday law and we're going to be overwhelmed. Right. So we can see that in order to face the Sunday law, we have to have the experience of Christ. We have to understand this line. And I'm not just talking about like an intellectual understanding of the math of it and how it works and that you can draw it out. But when we look at the 70th week of Christ, is that saying anything about us? It says a lot to the person, to the individual. Okay. Can you explain? Well, okay. <clears throat> we have the situation in 457. We know that there has been a period of reunion that was being offered. We have a choice in this 70 by 7 that either we are accepting by faith what Christ is doing for us or we are setting it aside and choosing not to accept what he's doing for us. Under one, we are finding ourselves under the first angel's message. Under the other, we are finding the revelation of the second angel's message. If we have not accepted the first, then we will not be benefited by the second. Yeah. If we have not accepted the second, we cannot pass unto the third. Okay. So we, we have this acceptance of these messages. When we look at this chart, which I also shared with Colin's, the Colin's study. And we know that this is the 777 days. Is there a relationship between the 777 days and the 777 years? I would have to say yes, that there is. And, and didn't we put the Sunday law at December 25th, 2021? Yes, we put yes. a type of Sunday law at that point, yes. Yeah. Now, we put it there, not because we believe that a Sunday law was going to happen on December 25th, 2021. I mean, we, we, we played with the idea, but we said that, well, that's as far as our line goes, and so the Sunday law has to be after that at some point. But we know December 25th is also the day Jehoiachin is released from prison, it's also the 20th day of the ninth month, which is Ezra chapter 10, which we've talked about extensively. But we would have to recognize that just like in, in order to be prepared for the Sunday law, 
we have to accept this line. That is, this is our experience that is typifying the preparation for the Sunday law. It's typifying our message that's going to be given to the Levites. Can we agree with that? Well, I've got a question. Yeah. Okay, we have the two periods of the 252 days, right? Yeah. Is one not a period relating to the priests and the other for the Levites? Okay, so because what we're talking about is the typical line. So we know that this line is typical. That is, we're not saying the Levites are interacted in this time, right? All right. Okay. So, yes, we can say that. That is, it's a chiasm, and July 18th is the center of it. Correct. And it was a test for a group of people. What's that? I was going to say the July 18th is not the exact center, but it is the tipping point. Well, it's the center of the two, the 540 days with the 225, the 252. I'm looking at the 252, not the 525. All right. Right. So, cause you got March 27th. Okay. I, I'm following yeah. your point. Yeah. So it's a center. So it's, 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 it's a test for a group of people. Us. Us right? This movement. But it also has the 525 days to December 25th. Right. And, and, and that's, that's where we, we develop this preparation of this message because we have to give this message to the Levites. And this, this is, is part of our tarrying time. It leads us to December 25th. Yeah. So the lines is our, plus our experience is the living testimony. Now, you know, I have a hard problem with some of the stuff that we're saying here. And, and here's the problem. The problem is there's so few of us. And I don't see that, you know, any of us in particular, and, and, and I'm talking about myself really, that, that I see that we can accomplish what needs to be accomplished. And so I've always believed that there's going to be other people coming in. Yeah. Do you have a comment? Okay. So are we to set aside what Gideon went through? Well, we, we would look at Jonah. We would look at Gideon. Well, and, and particularly what for, with Gideon are you referring to? How many, how many initial people came to the call of Gideon? Well, quite a lot. I can't remember the number, but. Right. But by the time it was done, it was whittled down to 300 people. Right. And the 300 were able to go up against a hugely more advanced war force. Yeah. And it wasn't through the force of men. It was because of what God himself had done. Right. So we're coming to a point right now. Like Gideon, just like the number of the Millerite preachers in from 1840 to 1844, where, yeah, the numbers are few, but God is taking this work into his hands, and we need to have the faith that he knows what he's doing, and all we need to do is follow where he leads us. And so it's in spite of what we see in ourselves— we have to trust that God is in control. There you go. And we can't be overwhelmed by the enemy. By what we there see. There you go. Yeah. It's a tough one, though. And that's what I'm saying. I mean, in, in, in some ways, I'm saying it's sort of maybe not tongue in cheek is the right way, but maybe ironically. Um, which is kind of tongue in cheek. You know, it's just that it just seems like this is so much that God's asking of us. And, and yet we know that it's, he's not asking it of us. He's asking us to trust that he can do what he has promised. Oh yes. man, you always say he's taking the work into his own hands. So he mm -hmm. has to do it. 
with our cooperation. And believe me, I've already started some of it and it is exhausting. I, it's got to be the Lord. I really see that it has to be mm. him. Yeah. And, and we, we know that God's going to lead this movement and we can't be, we can't have in our idea in our, in our mind of what it's, what it's supposed to be. Like Colin presented a really good study today. And, and I believe that he's correct. I don't think he's correct in every particular, but I think he was correct in his main applications. That is, he took um, the, the kings, the last kings of the United States that we, that we mark, you know, Reagan and uh, um, George Bush Sr. And, and we go through all these kings. And then we have Trump. And he laid this up with the, the, the image of Daniel chapter 3. So the in, image of Daniel chapter 3 is like the image of Daniel chapter 2. But what's the difference? The one's all gold. Okay. And that one that's all gold, it represents the Sunday law, does it not? Correct. Yep. yep. And what, what he did is he said, well, we can take the, the, the Revelation 17, because we can take Revelation 17, and we can line it up with Daniel chapter 2. Right? Five are fallen, one is, one is yet to come, but it'll continue, with, you know, but. Yes. And then the eighth is going to come, right? All those things, I didn't quote it word for word, but but we understand that. And, and so he laid that alongside the image of Daniel chapter 3 with Daniel 11, verse 1 to 4. And he showed that um, what happened the United States is, of course, um, in in the image of of or the um, uh, Revelation seventeen. The United States is the sixth kingdom. The seventh is the United Nations, and then you have the papacy. And um, so now, what we have is we have this this model. So he's going to use this riddle, and he's going to apply it to the United States itself, not to the entire line of prophecy, but just to the United States by taking the fact that we can take the image of chapter three and see that it's different than the image of chapter two. And so that golden image is going to represent the United States itself. So, so there's some merit in it. Now, the thing is they say it's going to be, um, at least Colin thinks it's going to be Trump himself. Though I don't know that we can say that. And, and I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't say that Trump is, comes back into power. But the Republicans definitely do. And we can see that Raffia is January 6th. But remember, we still are on a typical line. We don't know what this means in regard to the big line. But we know that the Democrats represent the King of the South and they conquered the king of the north, but the king of the north is going to come against him. Once again, not, not yeah. the Soviet Union. Yeah, like a, whirl, like a whirlwind. Yeah. So something's going to happen in the United States, and that's going to lead to the Sunday law. Okay, so let me, let me throw yeah. this at you. Okay. At this point, could we apply the situation with Raffia as the 2020 election and that Paneum could be the 22, 2022 election? Well, it's possible. I mean, that's the thing that I don't think we can do now is that we can't make the type of predictions that we made before. That is, we need to learn from the model that God has given us. We know that we're not time setters. Agreed. And, 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 and I would say that Raffia, yeah, it's, it's, it's a battle that culminates with January 6th. The reason, the reason I look at this is historically, especially over the last 40 years, the party that holds the White House loses substantially in the Congress 
in the midterm election that follows. Yeah. So there's... Oh, normally that happens. Mm-hmm. Most normally it has been, over at least especially over the last 40 years. Yeah. Now, you know, one of the problems that we have in the United States is a lot of people have died, old people, and, and once you die, you end up voting Democrat. Um, it so the truth. Yeah, so the Democrats have a lot more votes there. Uh, but also the younger generation coming up, from what I can see, is is much more politically active than a lot of younger generations have been, partly because of the Internet. Um, and And also they've changed the rules about elections now. So it seems pretty likely that if things are staying the same, that you would have the Democrats uh, still maintain a lot of power. But it is possible events are going to happen in such a way uh, that the Democrats, because, I mean, obviously we know they're not very popular as far as the president and vice president, but that doesn't say a lot about um, these uh, the midterm elections, but we don't know. Um, I'm just not going to make any kind of predictions about it. That I mean, that's my view, and I'm not just trying to play it safe. I think it's been quite clear that we can say that Jeff was right when he said Trump was the last president of the United States. The last Republican president or the last president? Well, he's the last president. Okay. The last president of a free United States. Yes. The United States on January 6th no longer was... The United States. That is, the characteristics of the United States disappeared on that day. And we are now uh, subject, and I say we, I'm a Canadian, but um, the United States is in control, being controlled by globalists. And that all the things that have been happening behind the scenes shows that the American public is not in control of its government. It's no longer a Republican nation. It's not just that the Democratic Party is in charge. It's that the Constitution has been rejected. So Trump is the last president of the United States. Yeah, the, this is the way I understand it, is that the United States, um, under the Constitution, ceased to exist mm-hmm. because the two horns no longer, you know, is no longer united. There's no longer republicanism and the protest is over. Yeah, we would say, and, and yeah, the protest definitely is over. But the events there with with what happened in the siege of Washington is is not just that, you know, the Republicans lost an election. A lot happened there behind the scenes that was a maneuvering with Republicans involved as well. That is, there was a lot of Republicans who didn't like Trump. There's, there was a lot going on behind the scenes that we don't know about. But there was definitely a hatred within the establishment the Republican establishment for Trump, even if they give a public face of supporting him. Trump really was stabbed in the back. Yeah, so basically whatever president is put in place after Donald Trump is being controlled by the globalists pretty much. Yeah. So, you know, so we don't know what it all means, but I do think that that Colin is on the right track in how he's applying uh, the prophecies from what I've seen. And and, and I believe that God's going to give us an understanding of these things. But the thing that's going to guide us always is going to be our past experience. And, And so we can't neglect these lines so i you know i presented to the canadian group do we believe in this chronology now a few said yes they do but i have reason to believe that most people in this movement don't accept these lines 
because I know some things you don't know. So there's definitely a, an opposition to this truth. And what you saw in that opposition, when I saw it as opposition, maybe you didn't, but that resistance to what Colin was presenting is a resistance to these lines as well. The thing about these lines is it keeps us on track. So mm -hmm. whatever we understand in the future, we have to bring back to these lines to give us clarity. That, that, that's what the movement has been doing with the Millerite movement and then since July 18th. Yeah. And now that we've hit December 25th, we should be applying the same strategic understanding, which is as things unfold, we bring them to these lines to, for God to enable us to see future light. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that these lines are not easy to understand. I mean, the chronology is not um, something that you can just passively watch some videos and, and have it down. So people have an excuse. Well, it's very, very complicated, but they don't realize how necessary it is. Now, there are some people, they struggle with these things, um, but they're willing to struggle with them. That is, they're willing to study them out even though it takes them time. But Brother other, Theodore. What's that? Brother Theodore. Yeah. You, you, you suggesting that I'm resistant to these lines. No. Why, why are you resisting? I'm not resisting. No, That's I know. I'm asking because you, I, I'm the one that brought it up. I'm the one that, that was asking him about the presidents being in the um, – Yep. But you weren't, you weren't there the whole time, were you? No, I wasn't. So what you had brought up, other people had already brought it up. Oh, okay. So, so you didn't but, start. But I want you to know I'm not resistant to them. I want to know them and know them and know them by heart. But yeah. I, just, I just had these questions of why he was using Donald Trump. Yeah. I just know that there's people who don't want to hear about the chronology. And that's a lot different than saying, well, it, I know it's difficult, but I'm going to study it, than to say, well, I have no interest in it. And, and they're not going to say that in that way directly and openly. They do it privately amongst themselves, not really in that, realizing that some other people that they talk to recognize what's going on. So, so we know that God has given us an experience and we can't reject it. And so if we take the counsel in the book of Hebrews, that counsel was written for us. The book of Hebrews was written for us. And we need to go back and study it again. Because this is about the covenant. This is about the lines. This is about the experience. This is about those who have faith. And this is about reflecting Christ's character in all that we do and how we interact with each other. And there can't be any, you know, jockeying for position within a movement. Because if you do that, you're showing what world you value. You just value the present world. If you value God's eternal kingdom, you will follow the counsel that Paul gives there in Hebrews chapter 13. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Because we're going to have a break before we have another discussion. But uh, so when's the next uh, the next uh, discussion going to be? Well, well, technically, I have you know four o'clock. I have a discussion, but you know we can have it earlier. I just, I need a break and probably uh, the other people would need a break. Some yeah. people don't mind just talking all the time, but for me, I, I need a break from it. Well, you've been so, talking uh, for a long time now, <laughs> for two, two days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but, uh, you know, we can come back to this and, and sort of open it up a little bit more uh, for questions that people have. Um, they might have questions for Dwight on some of the things he's been presenting. Um, we could even discuss what 
what little we know. Some of you were there for Colin's study, so you understand a little bit better what he was presenting. And, and then just to discuss a little bit about December 25th itself. Um, how do we relate to it? So uh, I, I did some presentations yesterday. And, and the one presentation that I did um, after Stephen's presentation, and Stephen's study is a little bit open for discussion too, for those that saw it. Um, on 508, and that deals with December 25th as, as well. Um, so, you know, we went through July 18th, and, and my focus was really trying to understand what December 25th is about. So, I mean, to me, that's that's kind of the, um, the topic for the day, considering it's the day. Um, so I suggest, you know, we have a word of prayer, and then we can come back in about 10 minutes if that's okay. Okay, I just wanted to say, um, I think these lines are necessary for us to, so because basically we need them to see where we are in time, mm -hmm. where we are standing at and all this history and the numbers and timelines show us exactly where we stand. So this is necessary. Yeah, it's light for our feet. Right. right. Yeah. Amen. And that's what we need. We just need light for our feet because we don't want to stumble off the path path and fall into the dark, wicked world below. And, and so that's what God gives us, sufficient light for the day. So let's close with prayer and then we'll come back in 10 minutes or so. <clears throat> and dear Father in heaven, uh, we are very thankful uh, for today that you have brought us this far in this movement, um, that we are 30 years since the fall of the Soviet Union, and that the message that you gave us at the beginning has continued, that your work upon us as individuals, no matter what time we came into to this movement, or what time you came into our lives or we allowed you in, that you are continuing that work. We look forward to the time when we can have rest from our labors. And we know that we can have rest in Christ now from the labor of sin. And so we come to you, we ask for forgiveness, and we ask that you can continue to continue the work that you have begun in us. Bring us together again in a few minutes, Lord, and help us to, to collect our thoughts and to hear your voice. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.